verses 7 through 14. <clears throat> this is where I'm supposed to stand for the cameras, by the way, so when we're recording. Um, so this is, I'm trying to get you, there's a little space in between I, that I have to stay in between, so I'm trying to do that. <clears throat> One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come to you and say, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Has anybody been to a, a wedding reception recently? Jesus was talking about a wedding feast, he's a wedding reception, some of you, a couple. Um, I think we've really ruined them. Uh, we've really ruined wedding receptions in the 21st century, uh, not because we make people do the chicken dance, that's ridiculous. We should not do that to anybody, ever. I don't know if that's a thing in California at weddings, but in Wisconsin, I mean, and any of you who know the whole polka culture, that's what we did. Uh, the chicken dance isn't what ruins it. What ruins weddings, in my opinion, is that we assign people their seats. We, we don't let them choose where they want to sit. Isn't that kind of weird when you stop and think about it? Because I think it would be really interesting to watch people walk into a, a wedding reception hall and pick the place where they want to sit, you know, and choose where they want to be. Here's the thing. The way a person chooses their place reveals a lot about how we want people to perceive us. Do you agree? The way we choose our place reveals a lot about how we want to be perceived. And so I think it'd be really fun at a wedding reception where there's, there's kind of a hierarchy in the, in the way that you sit, right? There's the head table, and um, that's maybe where the, the more honored positions are. And then there's, you know, the common places. And if we just let people pick where they were going to sit, don't you think it'd be fun to, to just watch and see... <laughs> what places people chose to sit in. How a person chooses their place reveals a lot about how we'd like others to perceive us. It sounds like when Jesus was invited to this really, really important Pharisee's house for a really, really important meal, Jesus was doing that. He was, he was watching people. And he noticed that people were choosing the positions of honor at this dinner. So he said, hey, I've got something to tell you all. It's a, a parable. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't take the most important place. Because if you do, <laughs> if you do, the host might come up to you and uh, bring someone who's more distinguished and more important than you are. And he might say to you, go sit over there. And that would be really, really embarrassing. That would humiliate you in front of everybody. 
So here's what you should do. Pick the lowest possible place that you can find, and then the host will notice that you're in a low position. They might come over and say, friend, move up to a better place. Now, I don't know if anything jumps out to you about Jesus' parable that he told there, but what jumped out to me is that somebody recognized someone in a low position. You know what I'm saying? Does that ever happen in the world? Do, do people ever actually recognize someone who's in a really low position in terms of status? That's not how the world works, is it? It's the people who are important and influential and the people who are, you know, making the name for, your, for themselves. Those are the people that the world notices and recognizes right away. And isn't that what, what would make us maybe a little bit nervous about taking the lowest place? Will anybody notice me? Will anybody think I'm important? Is, is anybody going to remember who I am and what I've done if I take the lowest spot? So Jesus' parable is different from life in that someone receives honor for taking a low position. That's not how it works in the world. You don't receive honor in the world for taking a low place. It's just not it. Uh, Bobby Unser, race car driver, do you remember what he's famous for saying? No one remembers the guy who finished second except the guy who finished second, <laughs> right? Nobody cares unless you're at the top. And so Jesus' parable is very different because he's saying you're honored for taking a low position. All right, so first, Jesus talked to the, the guests at this uh, luncheon, but then Jesus had something to say to the host, too. He noticed that the guests were choosing positions of honor, but he also noticed something about the host, that he was inviting people who maybe, you know, were people of means, they had some money, people who could pay him back, maybe, someday. People who were influential in the community, people who had a good reputation and could maybe help him build a name for himself. And so Jesus, Jesus said to him, I've got, I've got something to say to you too, sir. A parable. When you host a luncheon, <clears throat> don't invite the people who will help you build your reputation. Don't invite the people who will be able to pay you back. Don't invite people who make you feel good about yourself and, and uh, maybe they like uh, what, what you can bring to their, um, their uh, reputation and what, what they can bring to yours, and that's really all your relationship's about. Instead, here's what I want you to do. Invite people who could never repay you, like the poor or the blind or the crippled or the lame, and you will be blessed. Though they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That was it. Isn't that, that it, interesting? I mean, it's just, it doesn't sound like uh, true to life stuff. Who, who does that? Who would, who would ever hold a banquet for people who can't repay them or can't help build their reputation or can't, it's just, it just doesn't happen in the world, right? That doesn't happen. And so uh, I think what's really important today to remember is that these are parables that Jesus is telling. And they aren't meant to teach us how to host or attend a luncheon. That's not what Jesus, as much as all of us sometimes need reminders of the, the kind of etiquette we should have for going to an important uh, banquet or, attend, or uh, hosting one. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. These give us a glimpse of the kingdom, the reign of God. That's what these parables are about. They give us a, a glimpse into something that we wouldn't otherwise see. Has anyone heard of this man, Daryl Davis? Okay, uh, he's worth checking out. He's an African-American who lives in Maryland, and he um, reaches out to members of the Ku Klux Klan 
and asks to sit down and meet them. And he often begins with the question, how can you hate me if you don't even know me? That's a great question, right? How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Well, uh, Daryl Davis, some time ago, was on the Geraldo Rivera show. Does everybody remember Geraldo? <laughs> He's not, not really on anymore, but this is, goes back a ways. He was on the show with uh, some, some white supremacists who were openly raising their children to be members of the Klan. They were raising them to be white supremacists and weren't, you know, were, were proud to let people know about that, and they were on the show with Daryl. Long story short, the, the father, the husband of that family, ended up in prison. And Daryl uh, found out about it. And he called the, the wife, Tina, on the phone. And he said, hi, Tina, this is Daryl Davis. I was on the Geraldo Rivera show with you. And she said, yes, I know who you are. And she started cursing him out on the phone. How'd you get my number? Why are you calling me? I don't want anything to do with you. And he said, be quiet, Tina, just listen. <laughs> I want to fly from Maryland to Chicago, where they lived. And I want to drive you and your daughter down to the penitentiary, uh, which was about five hours from where they lived. I want to drive you down there so you can go and visit your husband. And he did. Paid for all of it himself, didn't ask for anything in return. And he took this mother and her daughter to go and see their husband who was in the prison. This man that they were supposed to hate <laughs> at great cost to himself took them to go and see their family member. And Tina, afterwards, said, God works through people like Daryl Davis. I didn't realize how blinded I was and how much my pride was leading me to destroy myself and destroy my children, she said. But Daryl has opened my eyes. Isn't that interesting? made me think about the kind of feast that God throws and the kind of people he invites. People who can't bring anything to the table. God invites people to his feast who can only bring their weaknesses, their flaws, and their disabilities. It's <laughs> The only thing that's going to keep us from the feast, brothers and sisters, and, and, and I, I think we all know this, and we, would, we can say it, but sometimes it's hard to... The only thing that keeps us from the feast is, is, is being too proud and wanting to be important. But God invites people who can only bring their flaws, their weaknesses, their sins. Because there's really only, only one human who's ever willingly chosen the lowest position, isn't there? I mean, there's only one. And what's so amazing about him is that he was the God who made us, and he came in our flesh. And like, he, des he deserved all the praise and honor and glory, and yet he took the lowest place there was. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and familiar with grief. He took the lowest possible place that there was with a bloody back and a bloody brow hanging on a cross really with hardly any clothes covering him, naked. And he did that for you and for me. Jesus went all the way down into the, the depths for us. And because he so humbled himself, the Bible says that God exalted him to the highest place. And he gave him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Yeshua, salvation, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord. <laughs> God lifts up the lowly, and he has lifted us up in Christ. The only thing preventing us from seeing that is pride and wanting to be important in the eyes of people. That's the only thing.
Sometimes when I come home on a sunny day, it's starting to get sunny outside, but it's sunny, lots of sunny days in California. I got the sunglasses on, right? So I put them up like this. Because I can't wear them in the house and still see things. I got to put them up, right? And you guys do this too, don't you? So I start, you know, doing what I need to do in the house, um, getting what I need to get. And then, like, it's time to go back to a meeting or a visit, and I have something I have to go and do, and usually I, unfortunately, wait longer than I should, and I become kind of hurried and frantic. I'm like, all right, I got to get my glasses, because it's going to be sunny. It's California. Like, you got to get some sunglasses on, right? And so I go over to the place where Jana, you know, she's super organized. Sometimes it drives me nuts, but she puts things in places where they should go. Right? Because this is how I eat. life is the easiest. <laughs> and I go and I look in the place where she has things and sunglasses aren't there. Right? Felix, what'd you do with my sunglasses? Where'd you put them? Right? I'm in a hurry. I got to get going. I'm angry. I'm upset. Felix, what'd you do with them? Because you just blame everything on the little kids, right? Aren't they the ones that usually, <laughs> they usually mess it all up? Where are they? And Felix will look at me, he says, Dad, the sunglasses are on your head. What kind of a person <laughs> looks all over the place for something that they already have? I do. You, you do. We all do. In Christ, God has given us all the approval, all of the forgiveness, all the justification, all of the, the lifted up -edness in Christ. He's given us all of it. The sunglasses are on our heads, right? Sunglasses are on your head. And then, <clears throat> I think this was one of the things that helped me the most, and I hope it helps you, but I remember a pastor saying these words and they just hit me like a ton of bricks. Because Jesus is extraordinary, I'm free to be ordinary. Because Jesus is somebody, I'm free to be nobody. Because Jesus is strong, I'm free to be weak. And because Jesus won, I'm free to lose. And then all of the, the real big things in life become small, and all the small things become big. Like waking up on Monday morning and going to the job through which we serve our neighbors. That becomes a big deal all of a sudden. And loving a spouse well all of a sudden becomes a really, really big deal. The one that God gave you. And loving the children, maybe, that God has given you becomes a big deal. <coughs> Taking a friend out from Crown of Life who you know is going through something, that becomes a really big deal. Let's go get coffee. Let's go, let's go have breakfast together. And tell me, tell me what's going on. And, and let's, let's cry about it together. And let's pray about it together. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so as Peter tells us, humble yourselves therefore that God might lift you up. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Let's join together and confess our faith in the true God with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.